Welcome to Story Hour, a virtual meetup hosted by Wolf and Heron. All right, Stephen, I saw your hand go up. Would you like to share a story? Um, I'll tell you a sea story. Okay, go ahead. You've got five minutes, and Doug will give you the hand signals. I've been living on the sea for the last five years, and there was a uh, one one um, couple of days that I can recount. There was a um, a series of events that led up to a very a strong mental confusion while I was sailing uh, sailing my boat, and that confusion has was. Uh, really gripping at the time, and it's it's still uh, a memory that um, I I like to tell people about it because it tell it uh, it uh, is a tale of how other people might be caught in a in a mental delusion, a stressful stressful point stressful place, and uh, making a judgment call that's off. The uh, the story goes that I was um, trying to get from the north coast of the Dominican Republic to the British Virgin Islands, and that is a long way directly east. You have to go across the Mona Passage to Puerto Rico, which is an area of uh, very tricky winds and uh, thunderstorms that come off uh, Puerto Rico. Then you go the whole length of Puerto Rico going east. And the important point here is that the trade winds are blowing from the east. So you're going into the wind the whole way. It's usually a, a brutal journey. And it's the, uh, it's the section of travel to the Eastern Caribbean that is uh, famous for uh, discouraging sailors. Now I was in the still I was committed to a timetable to be in in the British Virgin Islands in at Christmas time. My wife was away, so I was alone on the boat. I recruited a, a crew member to come with me, who backed out a couple of days ahead of time. I desperately went and found another crew member to come with me, who actually came to the boat we were preparing we were sleep we slept on the boat that night we were going to leave the next morning and his mother died he got a phone call he left me and then i'm i discovered there's a, a weather window that is opening and it's really a remarkable cessation of the trade winds the the wind from the east is going to die for something like 40, 50 hours. And I don't want to miss this opportunity because it will make life immensely easier if I can go at during this window. I won't have to be beating into the wind and into the waves. So I set off alone at about um, 10 o'clock in the morning. I'm going to go east with my motor on, there's no wind, which is a very remarkable situation, but I can't sail because there's no wind. It's nice because there's no wind, but it's easy because I'm just going to motor. However, the, the difficult part is I've got 40, 48 hours, 50 hours of time that I have to be awake and focusing on the seas and the traffic around me the weather, uh, anything that might interrupt my, uh, my uh, pro okay. progress. I'm an old guy already. <laughs> I'm going to be awake now for 50 hours. I don't want to be asleep. I, actually, I can't be awake for, for 50 hours. I'm going to take naps, but they're not going to be more than 10 minutes. I've got my cell phone, a little alarm thing. I'm sleeping in the cockpit. I put the alarm on for 10 minutes, 15 minutes at most. I wake up. I take a look around. I check the radar. 
I check the, the visuals, I check the engine meters, I do all the, the uh, necessary things, and then I try and put myself back to sleep. Every 10 or 15 minutes I'm doing this. And for the first 12 hours, of course, I'm, this is easy. I try and take a few naps. But the first night goes by, and um, now I'm sailing at night. There's something, there's a lot of things different at night. You can see lights very well, but anything other than a light is very difficult to see. A log on the sea is pretty well invisible. So you've got to be aware of hazards that um, are extremely difficult to detect. You've got to be vigilant. You can't let these things creep up on you. And you could easily creep up on a 300-ton uh, shipping. Uh, Wrap it up. Uh, okay. Now I've... Container. All my Container. Time menu. <laughs> At the end of this era, I've got one night, another day, another night. It's almost dawn on the second day. I'm, I'm up to 48, 50 hours of mental fatigue. In the very early light, I see something in front of me. There's a shoreline, a beach. Behind the beach is a row of trees. And behind the trees is a row of, of um, hills in the background. I see it in front of me. I look at the chart. The chart says it's not there. I look at the radar. The radar says it's not there. I go back to my eyeballs. My eyeballs say it's there. I have immense cognitive dissonance going on. I just can't make all these sensory apparatus match up. I need to do something. I'm approaching this shoreline. All my mental apparatus says one thing. My visual, my sensory apparatus says another thing. And in the end, I decide to turn and go where everything is clear, where my AIS says there's, there's nothing out there. My radar says there's nothing out there. My chart says there's nothing out there. And my eyeballs say there's nothing out there. I, cha I change the direction of the boat, and I go completely sideways to where I really want to go, but I need to stay away from a potential hazard. In an hour, the visuals clear up. They go away. I turn back in the original direction, and life is fine. But during that half hour or an hour, the visuals are so strong. I should have taken a picture. I wish I had a picture of it now so that I could show it to people and tell people what fatigue and mirage can do to your brain. End of story. Okay. Thank you, Steve. <laughs> All right. So what are a couple of things that, what were some things that were good? I could go. Go ahead. Okay. So I, I think it sounds like a story that's definitely been told a number of times because it's just so sleek and smooth. <laughs> definitely enjoyed it. Uh, really kind of introduced the environment and the stakes very well and then progressed us through some uh, edge of the seat uh, moments. Um, but I think, uh, Steve, Stephen, you, you found out the, the harsh constraints of five minutes early on. <laughs> <laughs> That was an eight and a half minute story. So you yeah. went almost double time. That's fine. My first one was 13 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, also on that note, Stephen, I just want you to know that if you're ever short a crew member, you literally just need to call me. The answer is absolutely. <laughs> totally down for that. Sounds wonderful. <laughs> Turning over to the next person. Well, yeah, what else? What's another thing Stephen did well? Go ahead, Pablo. I think that uh, Stephen is a great, uh, his demeanor is actually very, he's soft spoken and, and he can actually take an audience. That gives me the, uh, the confidence to keep listening to him. He just has a calm demeanor, you know, in, in, in high seas, he's, like, he's got a calm demeanor. 
even you know when confusion comes along he, he's able to actually just say okay i'm gonna take this step to find the answer and that's like actually a great story because you know when we are when i am confused i'm like oh uh, what i'm gonna do sometimes you know even when i'm talking you know in front of a camera i'm like i forget things i go you know completely wide i, I forget about I, what, what i'm talking about so i guess um you know i get, take take a deep breath um rewind things around and then and then see if we can you know just uh change direction or just put ourselves into the right direction and i thought it was a, a beautiful story and my curiosity actually uh it's invited me to ask him what took his student to to uh, to become a uh, to love boats in the sea, <laughs> the sailing. Yeah, that's a whole other story. <laughs> yeah, I bet. So one of the things that I wanted to say, there's actually two things that I thought were really great about the story. First, you are um, telling a story about a context that a lot of people don't understand. Um, not a lot of people have lived on the sea and know what all of that means, and the and the fact of you know, weather windows and, um, you know, navigating timelines and people and what can go wrong um, is important to understand in order to understand what you're up against. And, and you did a job of setting those, setting that context for us so that we could all participate in the story, even though we're not sailors. Uh, the other thing that I think you do well, actually, and it's something that is very rare to see, is that you're, you don't lean very heavily on filler words. You're actually quite comfortable with the use of silent space um, when you are processing to get to your next sentence or thought. And that can be, um, as, a, as a storyteller, that's a really awesome strength that you can have, um, rather than constantly using filler words. What about opportunities for Stephen's story or explorations and experiments? Go ahead, John. The climax, um, first of all, I love the story and the telling of the story. Um, the climax, I think that you could use more sensory language to bring us more vividly into the moment. So did you hear things as well? Did you hear waves washing up on sea? Did you hear gulls? Um, what kinds of trees? and vegetation did you see like a little more detail about but did you smell i mean i'm sure that you smelled salty ocean air but was there anything distinct about it that that type of thing would have and if you had more time this would have been easier obviously but that you could use stuff like that to bring us more vividly into that key moment when you're hallucinating this shoreline <laughs> Yeah, I think we all want to feel the cognitive dissonance that you are describing and the use of details, all the sensory details is a great way to, to bring the audience through that. Other thoughts or experiments that Stephen can try? So a, a suggestion, one of the things that I said as a strength is that you're very good at setting context and your context took four minutes for a five minute story. And so, yes, set context and play with how you can be really um, intentional and clean about the contextual details that are important um, and, and make your point in a sentence rather than seven. And, and that's just a, a, you know, that's a practice in a lot of ways that you can, the more you tell the story, the more you understand, oh, this minor detail about the log being hard to see maybe isn't relevant. <laughs> <laughs> right, and so it can be. Um, it, that's that's the the opportunity to play into as well. Is your strength and an opportunity? I just want to follow up on that. Uh, hi, my name is Milo, and I'm a context -aholic. Uh <laughs> I usually take like five or ten minutes to set up a story, and so the reason you're probably hearing my my story be so disjoint is because right now I'm actually experimenting with how to truncate that beginning into a simple setup. Uh, so I just wanted to say that if anybody else is struggling with that, it's, uh, it's something that is, I, I feel like is getting better, but definitely that. It helps when you're setting context to know where you want to end. Because very often what's important about your context is only the details that help your, your audience understand your point. So if you get to the, if, you know, in this particular case, the point is more about what sleep deprivation can do to, to create 
mental and physical dissonance, right? And so like, what do you need to know in order for that point to be drawn? Um, and, and the rest you can meet. Visit wolfandheron.com to find out more about our story hours. <laughs>